The Proposition by D.D. D. Poey Red light glistened and scattered through the frost-covered trees. The last bleeding rays of the sun spilled over a rolling terrain, laden with crystallized fir trees and dense thickets of brush covered in snow. The hills were silent but for the gentle whistle of the wind through the snowflakes and the persistent stamp of a man's boots. Weira adjusted his pack upon his shoulder with a grunt. His breath puffed in a thick cloud which hung on the frigid air. Snowflakes swirled about his head, landing upon his face and catching in his beard, but the feeling had long since left his nose and cheeks. The frozen air dug into his gloves and boots. It seeped through the layers of his coat and threatened him with icy fingers. His limbs were beginning to feel as though they were stone, and his lungs burned. Weira knew that if he didn't make shelter by nightfall, he would freeze for sure. So he kept his feet moving, step after heavy step, more aware of the looming darkness with each passing moment. The frigid air was deadly, killing you slowly and taking you peacefully. But there were plenty of creatures in the darkness that would not be so kind, and Weira had no intention of dying tonight. On he marched through the trees, over a path invisible beneath the snow. In his mind, Weira was certain that the tavern must be close, but the cold was beginning to slow him both physically and mentally. He took in his surroundings on the move, afraid of stopping, and was rewarded with the soft glow of firelight in the distance. Tiger's Paw The trees concealed most of the buildings that made up the small waypoint, but the tavern stood alone and proud at the very edge of the village, in plain sight of everyone crossing from the pass. Weira dragged his feet up to the door, following the sounds of loud talking and clattering cups, as much as the glow of light and promise of warmth. He hooked a gloved hand in the handle and gave the door a sharp pull. A rush of heat poured through the opening, washing over him and making the blood in his limbs prickle and dance. Weira stepped inside, dripping with wet snow, and yanked the door closed behind him. He stood for a moment, head down and eyes closed, enjoying the heat of the fire. He let out a deep sigh, rattling the ice that was still clinging to his beard, and flexed his hands. It was the silence he noticed first. When Weira entered the tavern, he was so desperate to thaw that he hadn't noticed everyone falling silent around him. When he opened his eyes, he found every eye was upon him, and no one seemed happy at his arrival. "'I don't know who you are, lad,' said a rotund man behind the bar. "'But I think it may be best if you turn round and go back to where you're from.' Weira's eyes flicked from one man to the next. There were at least a dozen men seated at tables, half that at the bar, and all of them were armed. "'Now, now, Yorner, that is no way to treat a stranger, is it?' asked a sallow man with the face of a ferret. He rotated in his chair and let his mouth gape. The men sharing the ferret's tables narrowed their eyes at Weira, and several others voiced quiet approbations. Weira lifted his right hand to his mouth, bit down on the fingers of his glove, and pulled his sword hand free. Now you listen here, lad, the bartender warned. You won't be wanting to do that. A man at the bar stood and laid his hand upon the hilt at his side. What's your name? the bartender demanded. Weira studied him for a moment, short, Round, pale. His thin brown hair was a wild mess that fell to his shoulders, and his beard was groomed short with clear red hues. His eyes were shrewd, but thoughtful. Weira decided that if it came to a fight, he would spare the barkeep. Though when he looked away from the bartender and let his hazel eyes rake across the crowd, his confidence took a shot to the gut. On a good day, Weira could take on a dozen drunks and thieves without a second thought. But tonight... Fresh from the snow and still flying, he looked about the room and had his doubts. Weira tried to wiggle his toes and pain shot up his leg. He was stiff, cold, and his feet felt as though they were blocks of ice. He wasn't convinced that he could move, let alone defend himself against a group nearing twenty in number. The locals were building their courage, and his chances were decreasing by the minute. He placed a hand upon his sword and dared the men to come at him. "'You really think you can pull that and come out alive?' asked the ferret, who nodded to a massive man beside Weira. 
The giant stepped behind Weira and dropped the bar across the door. Across the bar came the sound of laughter, cutting through the tension with obscene efficiency. Weira scanned the faces until he halted at the ferret. Thin man perched next to him, grinning from ear to ear and looking straight at Weira. He was better dressed than most, with an ill look at his face and that signature grin. I'll be damned, he cried out, spitting. I didn't think I'll see this day. The skinny man stood laughing and stepped around Weira, while a sea of angry faces looked on. No more holes in Byleanth to crawl into, eh, Weira? At the mention of his name, the room drew a slow collective breath. The big man balked and huffed disbelievingly, but his companion seemed convinced enough. Men sat holding food in their mouths, afraid to make any sudden movements. The only person in the building that seemed to have any energy was the thin man, who faced Weira and slapped him upon the arm. "'You look terrible,' he announced, taking a position at Weira's side and laying an arm over the man's shoulders. "'So do you, Sai,' Weira replied. "'What do you want with us?' the bartender asked in an unsteady voice. "'I have business in the village, but first I'll have some ale and a bite to eat.' The barkeep studied Weira, trying to read if the business meant good or ill for the tavern. Ah, Yorner, Sai cried out. Just give this man what he wants. The first is on me. You already owe me fifteen pieces, Yorner reminded the skinny man. And what is two more, Sai replied, then turned to Weira and lowered his voice. Oh, they are going to write songs about this night. We'll find some trouble yet, I think. That's not why I'm here, Weira reminded him. I doubt you'll have much of a choice from the look of things, Ferret muttered with a smile. Sai led Weira back to a table and sat across from him. As he moved, Weira tried to hide the difficulty he was experiencing in simply walking across the space. His name was the only thing keeping him safe, but even that wouldn't be enough if one of these men guessed him weak and picked a fight. He avoided the stares of the other occupants and instead focused on the back of Sai's head. The room all kept wary eyes on him as he sat glancing at Weira from behind their cups and talking in low voices. Yorner walked over and dropped a tin plate heaped with roasted ribs upon the heavy oaken table, which clattered noisily. With a thud, he set a full mug of golden ale beside the plate. Weira nodded and gave his thanks to Yorner, who grunted and stomped back to the bar. Nice guy, Weira commented, picking up a piece of blackened meat and tearing off a bite with his teeth. He's an ass, Sai assured him, and he'll hand you over the first chance he gets. He knows who runs this town, and he has plenty of friends. Weira took a long pull of his ale and gazed about the room. From face to face he found a pattern developing. Thieves, criminals, murderers, turncoats and deserters, sellswords and pirates, the filth of humanity and the dirty underbelly. Weira chuffed and took another drink. So, why haven't you killed me yet? Sai blurted, banging a fist against the table. We're more alike than you might think, and I only kill men for business or pleasure. As of now, you're neither. And which one might I become? Weira quipped. Both, the man chuckled. We'll know soon enough. I'll keep that in mind, Weira replied with a crude smile. He let his eyes continue to scan the room, looking from face to face. Yorner was eyeing him angrily. In the opposite corner, a group of men sat in shadow and Weira recognized them as the Smocks. They were a vicious family who ran the local gangs. From the petty crook to the hardened killer, if you wanted to live on the other side of the law, then you answered to the Smocks. More accurately, you answered to Kilroy, or his second-in-command, Sai. Weira bit off another piece of meat and nodded at Kilroy, smiled and toasted his mug in reply. You aren't wasting any time, then, Sai asked. Don't see why I should. Weira answered, tipping the last of the ale down his throat. He tore another bite of ribs from the bones, sucked in the fat. His hands were coming alive, and his feet were starting to tingle with sharp pricks from the heat of the room, thawing his boots. The sooner I get this done, the better. Yeah, Sai agreed. That's what I always say. Never wait. Don't think about it. Just rush in and make a hasty deal with a powerful man. A man, I might add, that could have you murdered at any time, and for any reason. And you're any better? Weira took another bit of meat. Last time I remember, you were the one who chased me around Byleanth like a madman. 
No, I'm worse, Cy grinned. But you're not making a deal with me, are you? Weira shook his head and stood. Under the eyes of the entire tavern, he crossed the room and stood beside the smock table. Kilroy nodded and two of his men stood and stepped aside. Weira took a seat and Kilroy lifted a drink to his lips. So, he said politely, what can I do for the infamous Weira? Weira looked about the room and all of the ears and eyes that were now focused on the table. Can we talk in private? he asked. Kilroy gave a wry smile and nodded. Follow, he answered, pushing the table away from him, almost spilling his ale as he got up. Weira noticed the way he weaved when the man stood, and the confidence which radiated from him. He might have been pissed drunk, but he was still the boss in this place, and no one said a word. They moved through the room and came up to the bar under the watchful stares of those in the tavern. Kilroy paused and flagged Yorner to him. We need a little privacy, he said to the barkeep. Based on the resolution in Yorner's expression, Weira assumed they would have absolute peace. The bartender tipped his head and crossed his thick arms over his chest. Kilroy smiled back at Weira and tipped his head at Yorner, whose glare was as cold and hard as steel. Weira followed Kilroy around the end of the bar and into a small room. Weira entered and looked about, finding a small space lined with shelving along the walls and laden with many jugs and barrels. The center of the room held a small table and four chairs. Kilroy pushed the door closed behind them, then grabbed the door's lever and made sure it was locked. He smiled at Weira and held an open hand out toward a chair. You have a lot of nerve coming here, he said in an odd tone. Weira wasn't sure if the man was offended or proud. I heard you seek that quality in your men, he answered as Kilroy took a seat. Kilroy chuffed and narrowed his eyes. That was strictly business and so is this, he answered simply. So get to it. I have a proposition for you, Weira answered. You see... A certain wealthy individual will be making his way up to Whitestock tomorrow, he said slowly. He will have with him a small fortune, and much of it will be in gold. Exactly how wealthy of a man are we talking? Two hundred pounds of gold, Weira answered casually. That and maybe more. He sat back and watched Kilroy carefully straining to read his thoughts. The man contemplated Weira for a moment, then ran his finger up a scar which stretched from above his left eye all the way to the top of his head. He scratched his thin hair and shook his head doubtfully. I don't like it, Kilroy confessed. Something's just not right here. Who's your so-called wealthy individual that goes moving through these roads with a king's store in tow? He chuckled disbelievingly and eyed his guest. <laughs> also, he added as an afterthought, how is it that you have come to know so much? You hear a lot living in the shadows, Weira said almost playfully. You become good at listening, or else you find yourself in a set of chains rather quickly, or dead. Weira paused, but it was clear that Kilroy would need a more clear answer. He's just a spoiled brat that acquired from his father a pile of wealth. I've been watching him for months. Kilroy kept silent for a moment, still eyeing Weira skeptically. Well, he asked finally, how do you want to do this? Weira cracked a smile. That's what I wanted to hear, he replied. I'll need two of your finest men, or I guess three good ones would do just as well. We'll leave first thing in the morning. Their path will take them around the south end of Tiger Paw. We will intercept him and take everything of value. And your cut would be? Kilroy asked in a tone of void emotion. Cut? Weira asked, shaking his head. No, I'm not interested in gold or jewels or any other shiny bits in his wagons. I just want one thing from him and the rest is yours. Kilroy furrowed his brow and cocked his head to one side. And that one thing you want, he asked. What is it? Nothing of any value to you, he replied evasively. Kilroy looked directly into Weira's eyes and promised, If I find out you're screwing me, I will personally rip out your heart while you live and feed it to the dogs. Weira's smile held, though there was violence at the corner of his lips. I guess that's fair enough he decided. Do we have a deal then? Kilroy swung his massive arm toward Weira, and both men shook hands. Good, Weira said with a satisfied smile. I'm not sure I should trust you, Kilroy confessed. 
The feeling is mutual, Wehrer replied. Kilroy laughed freely and stood. <laughs> Come, he said, gesturing toward the door. Have a drink before you make me a very rich man. Wehra gave a sly look and rose from his seat. The men left the room and Kilroy gave instruction to Yorner that Wehra was to have whatever he wanted. He then nodded to his new partner and returned to his table. Wehra shrugged at the plainly upset Yorner and took a seat at the bar. He ordered an ale and tried to convince himself that he hadn't just signed his life away to a living monster. He was sure that he could defend himself, but there wasn't much to be done if Kilroy decided to ambush and overrun him. Weyra's name took with it a bit of respect wherever he went, but that also presented itself to many dark individuals as a challenge. His head was a trophy, and there was certainly more than one brigand in this very room who would love to boast that they were the one that cut down the great Weyra. He shook his head at the thought and took another pull from his drink. He was once a respected man, revered in every circle, but now here he was, lowered to this slimy tavern and surrounded by criminals. This night would not go quietly, and Weyra wondered what would come first. His question would be answered before he could even finish his first mug, as Sai's voice blasted throughout the building. I have been challenged, he screamed. Everyone turned at the cry, drawn from their drinks and conversation by the possibility of a fight. Me, the one and only Psy, challenged to a duel. As though on command, men stood and began to move the tables out of the way, making a large empty circle in the middle. The scene gave Weyra the impression that this was not an uncommon sight at the tavern. He challenges me for respect, Psy continued, railing like an excited madman. But, he added, holding up a finger to the ceiling, can he acquire it? Men throughout the hall laughed and banged their feet against the ground, making the very walls shake from their pounding. Men took their seat or stood along the wall, hands full of ale, meat, and anticipation. Weyra spun all the way round and caught sight of the challenger. He was a small man, wiry and filthy. He gave the impression of one desperate to prove himself. The man's legs swayed like soft reeds as he stood to one end of the cleared space, holding an old rusty dagger. Weyra didn't see a killer in the man's eyes. He saw nothing more than a broken, petty thief. But that didn't stop Sai from accepting the duel. This man, Sai cried, leveling his finger at the opponent. He thinks he will have the best of me tonight. Well, he asked the man directly, who swallowed hard and wiped his nose on the back of his hand. Go ahead. Sai took a little bow and showed his empty hands. The silence pressed against those in the room with a tangible force. Everyone was locked in including Weyra, waiting for the first move. The man rocked back and forth on the balls of his feet, debating his first move. In this world, Sai taunted, there are takers and there are beggars. Come now, what will you be, brave fool? The man suddenly hoisted his knife and charged, screaming a wild battle cry. His arms flailed wildly at Sai, who easily dodged it and gave the man a shove in the back. The thief stumbled into a table under the stairs and laughter of the crowd. He pushed himself up and straightened his stocking cap. Sai bowed to the crowd, soliciting even more cheers. Weyra pushed a few of the spectators aside and moved up to get a better view. The thief ground his teeth and gave a little snort. Again he flung himself forward, and again Sai effortlessly tossed him aside. This time, Sai kicked him in the pants and cackled like a crazy old woman. <laughs> Men were laughing so hard tears were leaking down their cheeks. They slapped each other and pointed at the thief, watching a cat toy with a mouse. Not waiting, the man pushed hard off the table and brought the knife slicing through the air in a great overhand arch. Sai stepped into the stroke and deflected his arm with a thud. As fast as Weyra could process the move, Sai had stripped the knife from the man's hand and held the blade at his throat. It's not long now, friend, Sai whispered into his ear. He stepped back and threw the knife into the floor where it stuck beside the thief's foot with a crack. Sai chuckled and turned around. The thief bent over and in a single movement, he quickly and yanked the blade free of the floor and speared his arm toward Sai's back. Sai spun, his knife out and flashing through the smoky air. The man cried and dropped his knife, blood welling and dripping down his front. In the back? Sai asked patronizingly. Now that's not very noble of you. I've nothing, the thief cried, wincing at the pain in his arm. What have I to do with nobility? 
We're all kings here, mate, Sai replied, watching Wayra out of the corner of his eye. Now, get your knife up and finish this. The thief bent over, red life streaming over his hand and off the tips of his fingers as he scooped up his weapon. As he rose, the room became a little more dark, and a hush settled over the patrons. The man snorted like an animal and wiped something from the corner of his eye. Bright streaks of blood painted where his hand had been, and the thief took on the appearance of a great and terrifying demon. The only two in the room who seemed unaffected were Weira and Sai. The man started to exhale in wild growls that began as nearly silent, but built into harsh blasts. Sai smiled at the spectacle, which only seemed to provoke the man even more. The thief screamed and lunged again at Sai. This time, with his knife ready, Sai dodged and dragged his blade across the stomach of his assailant. He then pivoted and plunged the steel behind the man's shoulders. The thief wailed and fell to the ground, reaching desperately to pull the knife from his flesh. As he reached, the man began to spin slowly, causing the crowd to laugh again at the fool's antics. Sai clapped, then put the show to an end with a solid blow to the man's face. He fell to the ground like a sack of wet meat. Sai placed a boot on his back and drew the knife out of him. He wiped the blood off his weapon, then spun the blade so he was holding it overhand. Enough! Kilroy called out. Sai knelt, grabbed the thief by the hair, and exposed his pasty neck. The blade flashed and came to rest on his throat. Enough! Kilroy repeated. There will be no killing tonight. I wasn't going to kill the bastard, Sai promised. Though it would be doing him a favor. Bugger's dead already, if you ask me. He dropped the man's head with a thump and stood tall. Sai then strolled over to Weira and pushed his knife back in its sheath. Impressed? he asked. Weira looked him up and down, then said, "'Killing weak, starved, and desperate men is nothing to be impressed by.' "'My thoughts, exactly,' Sai answered. "'So how about a real bit of fun?' He gave Weira a dark smile and asked, "'Up for a little action?' Weira shifted in his seat, all too familiar with what was to come next. "'Men of the paw!' Sai called out, eyeing Weira with a cold smile. "'We are in the presence of a very special guest!' He spun a circle in the room, arms raised and a grin that was getting dangerously large. "'You've heard the stories,' Sai cried out. "'Now, see the legend for yourselves. The one and only Weira. Men all about the room stamped their feet, pounded their fists upon the tables, and hallooed wildly. Weira sat stoically in his seat. "'Come,' Sai said to him, holding out his hand. "'Let us see those famous skills with our own eyes.' There shall be no more killing today, Kilroy declared, slamming his fist upon the table. Who said anything about killing? Sai laughed. Relax, Kilroy. It's only a friendly duel to test those famous skills. I don't duel, Weira answered calmly. Oh, but surely you would not turn from a challenge, would you, Weira? Sai said in a patronizing manner. His eyes drifted to his gang, who began to laugh. The word coward could be heard over the din. Come, one of the smokes yelled, rising hastily from his seat and spilling his ale. Let us see if you know how to use that blade, or if it is just a pretty decoration. Weira looked over the drunken man and said, I've already told you, I don't duel. Coward, the smock declared. Weira's eyes narrowed at the accusation. He knew that he had faced more challenges, more battles, won more fights and killed more enemies than this drunken fool would ever manage on his own. He then looked about the room and he didn't see a group of men, but a pack of bloodthirsty wolves. The fight was inevitable, he decided. Face me, the smock roared, or forever be known as a coward. Weira set his cup upon the table and slowly stood, the folds of his red cloak billowing about him. He undid the clasp and dropped the cloak in his chair, then made his way to the circle. Yes, the smock boomed. Yes, come, let us see if you are more than just a story. In a long, slow, purposeful motion, Weira drew his weapon from its scabbard. His left hand reached up behind his head, and Weira drew out a second sword. With a blade in each hand, he rubbed the steel together for a moment, just to hear that old song, then squared off with the smock. Weira knew his opponent was large, but as he drew close, he found himself looking up into the challenger's eyes. He was not only taller, but also much broader. The man gripped his great sword like a titan of old, wielding one of the pillars of the earth. 
I am going to enjoy this, little man, the smock promised. We'll see, Weir answered calmly, blades resting confidently at each side. The room filled with the cry of battle as the smock raised his weapon and brought it streaking through the air. Weira stepped to the side with a parry and flashed his blade at the man's neck. A scratch appeared below his beard and spit a small line of blood to his collar. The smock reached to the cut and then inspected his damp fingers. "'Are we done?' Weira asked over the cheers of the audience. The smock's face darkened and he ground his massive teeth. He wound his sword over his shoulder and sent it whooshing horizontally. Weira jumped back. Then again as the blade came around the other way. The smock then sliced through the air in a great hammer stroke that Weira was able to deflect with ease. The great man huffed and wheezed, growing tired from the exertion needed to wield such a large weapon. He raised his blade again, and one of Weira's swords flashed across the smock's hand. The tip of the great sword fell to the ground, and Weira cut at the other arm, slicing him across the forearm. The broad blade clanged to the floor, and the smock's eyes grew wide and full of hate. Reading the man's expression, Weira suggested, Leave it be, friend. The smock growled like a feral animal, and Weira added, Let us be done. In a single movement, the challenger bent and plucked his weapon from the ground, and then swung wildly at Weira in a wide arch. The blade made a clear sound as it sliced through the air, level with Weira's neck. Though the slice was well short of its target, it did not stop the smock from winding up for another attempt. This time, Weira stepped inside of the blow and drove the butt of a sword into the side of the smock's head. The smock's eyes rolled and Weira slammed a boot into the man's knee. His foot came out from under him and the broad sword clattered to the floor as the smock caught himself from falling. The room erupted in hollers. We are done, Weira declared, and slipped a blade back into its scabbard. He turned his back and stepped toward his table. Weira didn't hear the knife come out of its sheath, but he heard the gasps of the crowd clearly enough. Weira looked over his shoulder and found the smock bearing down on him with a dagger held high. Weira's sword flashed and a gash split across the man's throat. Blood dumped over the edge of the wound and the room was silenced but for the wet sucking sound coming from the smock's neck as he struggled fruitlessly for air. The knife clattered and his eyes bulged while the room watched a champion die. With a loud and damp thud, the smock fell into a puddle of his low life and wheezed his last. The room stared at Weira in stunned silence. The speed and lethality of the attack left the room taking a step back in awe. Weira pulled a cloth from his pocket and dragged his blade through it, then slipped the sword home in its scabbard. Ron! Kilroy called out into the crowd. Get Dinman out of here! Weira! He didn't bother turning at the mention of his name. Weira quietly slipped back into his cloak and emptied his ale. Get some rest, Kilroy finished. The men will be ready at sunup. Aye, Weira muttered, making his way to a short hall to the left of the bar. But who will be watching the smocks now that I've killed a brother? Weira pulled his room door open and stepped into the simple chamber. It was lightly furnished with nothing more than a bed and a chair. The door, he was pleased to find, had a heavy bolt and a thick wooden bar, which was a hint at the type of company the tavern normally kept. He stripped out of his traveling clothes and tried to get comfortable upon the mattress but the hall was now filling with noise again as the patrons talked of the fights, and the memories scratching against the inside of his head wouldn't let him relax. Why am I doing this? He asked the darkness. Five years, Weira sighed. Five years is a long time. In his mind, Weira could still see the field littered with blood and armor and crows. The men in his camp, beaten, cut, and scarred, smiled at one another like demons. Dried blood decorated their faces, though whose body it came from, no one knew properly. The largest tent, set in the very heart of the camp, flapped lightly in the evening breeze, and the flags upon their standards waved lazily as a younger Weira entered the tent. General, Weira had asked at the door. Yes, came the curt reply of General Jorkinton, not bothering to look up from his maps. Weira stepped up to the table and winced at the object of the general's study. The army was camped on the fringes of King Warmich's land, a region called Nororitnea. While the valley seemed fertile enough, the company was running low on supplies and men were in fear of starving. To provide for his army, Jorkinton had ordered raids along the villages within Warmich's domain. The men stole everything, from food and basic supplies, to animals and women. Any man from the villages who decided to fight 
was put to the sword. General Jorkinton, he said. My name is Weyra, son of Jarf. Yes? I know who you are, lad, the general replied, looking up for only a moment. You have a fine reputation, and I am told that the men know and respect you. I'm honored to have men like you in my ranks. Thank you, Weyra offered, but I must request a pardon. The general's eyes slowly rose to meet Weyra's. The commander leaned forward, hands upon the map, and asked, What have you done? I have followed every order given, Weyra said, but now I wish to be pardoned from further service. Jorkinton chuckled and stood straight. On what grounds? he demanded. I will not kill another innocent soul, Weyra stood firmly. The chuckling stopped, and the general looked down at the soldier with a serious expression. You cannot think it is so easy, Jorkinton declared. You are bound to service or face the deserter's fate. I am a killer, Weyra professed, but not a murderer. This is war, Jorkinton bellowed. Did you come to save your people, or did you come to allow Warmich to continue killing your brothers and raping your sisters, wives, daughters? And yet we are doing the very same thing to the innocents which inhabit the outlying villages, Weyra argued. We kill men who are not our enemy. We steal their food, their livestock, and then make off with their women. We have a store of them in pleasure tents all over the camp. Jorkinton stared at the fighter, wordless and impassive. It is wrong, Weyra declared firmly. War is not won by the faint of heart, the general proclaimed. Nor should it be waged by cowards, Weyra snapped. I will not put another man to the sword if I can help it. I fear you do not know what you are saying, my friend, Jorkington replied, lifting a cup from the table and taking a short pull. We are civilized people who do not deserve to be compared to the savages of Warmich's land. They are no better or worse than us, Weyra defended. I will not murder another. There is no murder in war, the general professed. There is no honor in killing women, children, and old men, the soldier replied heatedly. The general tipped his head back suddenly and laughed aloud. No doubt you are faced by the hardships of battle. We all are. Jorkinton donned a fatherly presence and stepped around the table. I will keep in mind all of the great things you have done, all of your wondrous feats, and forget that this conversation ever happened. I recommend that you do the same, Weyra, son of Jarf. Let us no more speak of leaving or pardons. No one is ever pardoned from my army, and a deserter would be seen as no better than Warwick himself. The two stood for a moment and considered each other, Jorkinton smiling at his warrior, while a darkness descended over the continents of Weyra. Return to your tent, and prepare for a long day tomorrow. Goodbye, General, Weyra said with a nod of his head. Goodbye, Weyra, he replied with a shrewd look. Weyra stepped out of the tent and disappeared into the night. The next five years passed and Weyra became a ghost. He was a legend whispered around the fire, set up as more than a man, and not quite a god. One tale led to another, and soon Weyra himself would not have recognized the man in the stories. In truth, he spent most of his days cold, alone, and constantly watching over his shoulder. He was more like a beast than a man, living off the land and avoiding the villages and towns of men. And now, here he was, risking it all. Weyra woke early, rising from bed and strapping on his swords to a faint glow from the door. He entered the tavern to find it nearly deserted. There were a few men passed out under tables, and a pair of smocks sitting against the main door post. Weyra mistook these two for sleeping drunkards as well, until one of them spoke. "'So the prince rises,' mocked one. "'Are you ready?' Weyra snorted his displeasure at the two ragged men. "'Only two, he grumbled. No, 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 your majesty, the second one sang. The other two were right outside. He bowed low and pushed the door open. Weyra took a step and peered outside. True, the man giggled. They've had better days. Weyra stepped into the frozen morning air and sighed in frustration. Crumpled in a bank of snow was the little thief who was slain by Sai and Weyra's own challenger from last night. The men were a mixture of blue and purple and red, topped with fresh snow. Their eyes were gray and sunken, much like the rest of their faces, and their lips were contorted in a petrified wail. "'I didn't know the little bastard there,' said the first smock. "'But the man you killed there was a hell of a fighter.' "'You better pray that you're better,' Weyra advised, tightening his coat against the cold, 
else you'll end up just like him. The second smock stepped close and squared off with Weira, pushing a short blast of air out of his nose. You can take all of them for I care, he informed Weira. I'm in no mood to die for you, deserter. Weira looked him up and down calmly. And for a pile of gold, he asked quietly, will you stick your neck out for that? I, the man answered without emotion, but don't expect me to waste my time watching over you. Wouldn't dream of it, Weira replied. Though, he said, I would like to know what I shall call you. Randall, said the first, and this is Tim, he added with a nod to the man before Weira. Nice to meet you two, Weira said politely. I hope to be surprised when I see you gentlemen fight. Try to remember who you're supposed to stick with the pointy end, he said, walking to the stables. The three men rode for an hour through the white forests and fields in perfect silence. Weira found the peace of the ride comforting, though he could not help but keep an eye over his shoulder. The group entered a short valley heavily laden with trees. Weira drew back on the reins and called, Hold! His two companions reined in and looked around. We set the ambush here, Weira ordered. Tim, you're in the bushes over there. Randall, you're with me on the opposite ridge. The smocks exchanged a glance, then headed to their positions. The sun was steadily climbing into the clear blue sky, though it provided little relief to the trio of freezing men. The horses had been tied off up the road, and the men held their positions, waiting for their caravan to arrive. Weira and Randall sat close to one another, concealing themselves in a wide stand of low evergreens, while Tim held his place across the road. Randall looked up and squinted into the air, watching the sun crest them overhead. They're not coming, he decided quietly. They'll come, Weira said, diligently watching the road. In this cold, Randall complained, my balls are frozen to my leg and I can't feel my feet for nothing. The sun is over the point of no return. They're not coming, he said confidently. Weira peered up the road and strained his ears. But I don't think that bothers you none now, does it? Randall grumbled. My comfort is none of your concern, but how about your own then? Will you shut up? Weira hissed. Come on now, Randall pressed. How are your balls, Weira? Weira shushed him and asked, You hear that? The men fell into silence as the sound of horses drifted through the trees. Weira stepped gingerly to the edge of the road and got low. The two smocks watched him suspiciously, loosening their swords in their scabbards. Weira placed a bare hand against the frozen ground and gave Randall an intense look. Get the horses, he said. Is it them? Randall asked. Go, Weira snapped back, flagging the men back. Get the horses. His voice was low and intense but the smocks only stood by and stared. "'Who is it?' Tim called out. Weira slunk back under cover as a team of riders around the corner came into view. "'There!' a rider cried loudly, pointing at Randall. "'The very men we seek!' Weira slipped up the road behind the cover bushes as Randall turned and ran into the wood. "'Here!' one of the riders announced. Weira turned to see Tim standing his ground in the road, brandishing a great sword in both hands. He swung once, and causing the rider to fall before he was run down by another rider. Wei returned from the scene and picked up speed. The surroundings slipped past him in a blur of white and green, his feet racing nearly as fast as his mind. Screaming from behind him and to the left meant Randall had been found. There's still another one, boys, a rider yelled to the rest. He can't be far. Flush him out. Wei dove through the brush, gaining speed and losing control. He raced in the straightest line he could manage, knowing all the while that the snow was painting a trail behind him. Panic rose within, and his blood coursed wildly through him. He was terrified and yet had not felt this alive in years. His path became reckless and his risks became greater as the sound of horses grew behind him. The voices of men echoed off the trees and Weira felt as though he was close to flight. A hill crested before him and Weira didn't pause to debate the choice. He planted a foot into the berm and launched himself into the air. His face burned in the frigid air and his limbs wheeled in slow motion as he floated into the void before him. For a moment, Weira felt as though he might fly clear out of the wood, until the ground stood and crashed up toward him. He fell through branches and limbs, slamming into a rocky slope that sent him rolling into the bottom of a steep gouge in the earth. His body flopped to a sudden halt against the trunk of a small tree, and Weira felt his body lose its shape. Blood trickled into his eyes and his limbs felt as though they had filled with water. The world faded in and out in short, blurry segments. He saw the sky and the trees and the outline of a row of horses high above him. He heard wind and breath dripping in blood 
and a man's voice as bright and sharp and cold as the snow around him. "'Serves him right,' he said, "'thinking he can kill the son of the greatest general in all of Byleth and get away with it.' Weyra's eyes stared back at the men, unblinking, watching them disappear onto the other side of the edge, blending in with the snow that had formed from clear sky and was now kissing the trees in delicate little flakes. Minutes passed and Weyra was unaware if he was alive or dead. His mind passed from his body and was somewhere far away, under a warm sun and a cool breeze. Darkness held him close, and his eyes shut slowly. His heart slowed and whispered about how easy it would be to just let go forever. No more running, no more hiding, no more fighting to stay miserable. A life void of joy or rest was nothing to struggle over. But there was a fire within the man. Weyra could feel it, like hot coals in his belly, melting the ice in his veins and igniting the resolve. He could see the faces of the men who had betrayed him, and he knew that his life, long and hard though it had been, was not to end like this. He rolled, moaned, cursed, and pulled himself to his feet. He placed hands upon his swords, still safely tucked away in their scabbards, and felt his face flush. He turned his boots toward Tiger's Paw and put one before the other. It was nearly nightfall when he came shuffling into the village. The lights in the tavern burned hotly, but that wasn't what drew him on. Weyra passed the noise in the heat of the hall and moved on to a stout house in the heart of the village. He walked up to the door and pounded three times. He slipped a dagger from his belt and held it at his side. "'Coming, coming,' grumbled the voice within. The door swung open and Sai smiled broadly. "'Yes?' The host took a second look and the smile disappeared. "'Shit!' He dove for his sword propped up by the doorframe, and Weyra brought down the dagger into his forearm. Sai screamed as the blade was wrenched free, spraying blood all over the entrance. Weyra moved into the room and gently closed the door behind him. He set the bar in place and turned back to Sai. "'What are you doing?' Sai cried out, squeezing his arm. His fingers oozed blood and Sai's expression became fierce. "'Have you lost your mind?' Weyra let his blade answer for him as it streaked through the air and opened Sai's cheek. The man screamed wildly and turned his face to the floor. You're insane! Sai accused. You sent them, Weyra declared. You sent the riders. What? Sai spat. They knew we would be there and exactly how many there would be, Weyra shared, flashing the knife again and cutting it to Sai's shoulder. They knew. Why would I do that? Old grudges die slowly, I suppose, Weyra answered. He knelt low beside Sai and looked him in the eye. All the same, he continued, I got what I wanted. Find a nice little late with a tight pink ass, did you? Sai replied. Do you even know who you killed? Weyra asked with a cruel smile. Do you have any idea? There are so many, he answered. How am I to know them all? Fulsturm, Way informed him. Fulsturm Jorkenton, the only son of General Jorkenton, the same that put that price on my head. Sai forced a smile through the pain. You tricky bastard. I didn't know you had it in you. Too bad your plans failed. Not exactly, Weyra laughed. It actually worked out pretty well, except on the personal level. Then again, he said, slowly plunging the dagger into Sai's side. The man roared in pain, and Weyra gave a little laugh. I do have you bleeding at my feet, after all. Stop this, Sai begged. Just end my shame, he said, spitting blood. I won't let you miss the best part, Weyra said. You don't get to kill the only son of one of the most famous generals in Byleth history and live to tell the tale. And how will they know it was us? Sai asked. They killed the two smocks you sent with me, Weyra said. I think they will put those two things together, and this village will be burned to ashes by tomorrow night. Why settle for a single bird when you can kill two with one shot? Congratulations, Sai wheezed. Now finish what you've started. I'm dying, Weyra. Dying, he agreed, but not dead. Weyra stood, turned around, and crossed the room to the door. Come back! Sai tried to yell. His voice caught and choked. Come back here and finish this or I'll find you, Weyra. I will track you down and kill you with my very hands. I'll be waiting for you, said Weyra, disappearing into the darkness. Weyra! Sai screamed. Till next time, Sai. Weyra!